How you doing? We're back with video number nine. Number nine. Uh, I didn't think I'd be making this many videos. But, we'll see. You know, we get a few viewers here and there. Um, and uh, I'll make them until I run out of material. We'll see what happens. Um, and before we get underway at the top, uh, click on uh, 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 subscribe and like and all the other things and you know maybe youtube will send me ten thousand dollars or something like that or maybe not um and leave comments comments are, are are uh important because they give me some kind of feedback in terms of uh who's watching and and what the people want me to comment on and and talk about and oh before i start there you go Yep, I'm old and grumpy, and I'm killing it. <laughs> it's a present for my daughter. Um, what I want to talk about today is something called the Malton Plan. This is really important. If you've grown up in Malton and you've gone to Malton schools, and especially if you've gone to the high schools in Malton, uh, whether it's Morningstar or Westwood or Lincoln, um, it's important because... Uh, uh, the history of education in Malton is something that uh, uh, very few people remember. I'm one of them. I lived through it, uh, and I lived through the results of it. And um, there are other teachers who were around, and students that were around, and they may not know the details, but it's important that this gets put down on record at some point in time. Um, and I'll try and make this a short, but it's not a short story. Uh, Malton used to be a, a small segment of old Malton, and then it would grow and, around the surrounding areas. And uh, um, what happened uh, after the war, uh, you had a lot of people move into the Malton area to work uh, airport-related jobs. Uh, there were manufacturers, had Haviland, was involved uh, and uh, it uh, it grew. Malton grew, and uh, in the seventies, sixties and seventies, especially in the sixties, it expanded east to the four twenty seven and north to the railway tracks, and uh, which is the upper limit of Mississauga, and down to uh, Dairy Road, and it was mostly inhabited by uh, families from. Uh, England, Scotland, Italy, um, um, Croatia, well, what was, was then Yugoslavia. Um, there were some uh, other European ethnic communities involved, uh, Malta, um, uh, and so on, and Canadian, of course, um, and uh, the, as long as, as as the jobs held out at, at the airport and near the airport with all the factories, Malton continued to grow and it tended to, to grow with young families to the point where the board decided in the 60s they needed to build a school in Malton. So they built schools and they built Westwood in around 67 or 68. And uh, it didn't take too long, but Westwood got filled and uh it, it was uh as i think i said in a previous video it wasn't as big as it is today um westwood basically the outdoor walls were the gym and that hallway that went around the side the shops weren't built yet the pool wasn't built yet uh so and malton um exploded in terms of families and and children and so on and in the early 70s, I believe, Peel decided to build a second school, a high school, just down the road, and they built that, and they called it Morningstar. And for a while, at that point in time, you had uh, grade 13 in both schools, both schools fed universities. I believe Darcel was the feeder school, well, it is the feeder school to Westwood. Um, I believe... Uh, Morningstar had uh, Lancaster and maybe one or two other feeder schools. Um, 
and they had two music programs, two phys ed programs, science programs, arts, everything. And what happened was, for some reason, the, the, the enrollment started declining at Morningstar. Didn't take too long. And by the late 70s, for a relatively new school, their enrollment was on the way down. And this concerned the board because they didn't want to close a brand new school and they couldn't close Westwood because it was full. So they came up with a way to save Morningstar. And this was called the Malton Plan. And the Malton Plan forever determined the subjects that would be taught at both schools and the image that both schools would have. At the time, there was grade 13, so both schools were, you could call them collegiates because they both fed into university. The Malton Plan called for Morningstar to become the academic school, Westwood to become something called an integrated model vocational school. And that was the beginning of the image that that Westwood ended up having and that it went on to become Lincoln's image and image throughout the board. And it, they never figured out what an integrated model vocational school was. It certainly couldn't be called an academic school because grade 13 was stripped away. So you couldn't offer grade 13 at Westwood, only at Morningstar. So if you were going to university, you had to go to Morningstar. If you were going to college, you could go to Westwood. But what Westwood lost in grade 13 in an academic program it gained in VOC programs, uh, hearing impaired, disabled, uh, shop programs. Uh, it gained a pool. It gained a lot of um, unique programs that were needed in the area. And it also gained um, uh, a lot of money to feed these programs and to fund them. And so uh, Morningstar became the smarter school and Westwood became the vocational school which was vastly unfair because the students were the same at both schools. What it did is when I came on board in 1983 it had already been in existence for a few years it prevented me from teaching grade 13 music and it um, it basically uh, curtailed the kind of courses I could teach. I couldn't teach advanced grade 12, for example. It had to be general grade 12. For people who wanted to take advanced grade 12, they had to go to Morningstar. And this was an issue. This was a big issue for me, but I just accepted it because it's what I'd walked into. Um, <clears throat> the interesting, the music teacher, by the way, at Morningstar was George Zajuban, phenomenal guy. A wonderful man, passed away many years ago, um, but he was incredible. He came on board when Westwood was still Westwood, and um, in its early days, Westwood so big that was so big they needed a second music teacher, and they brought in George to work with Carl Walhauser. And George, that's when they built the second row uh, of of rooms behind the gym, and it included a vocal room, which is where in recent years where the phys ed classes uh, hold their health uh, um, classes. But um, George was absolutely wonderful to work with. He and I collaborated on several different projects in spite of the fact that we were competing for students. We really were. Um, but uh, after a while, in the 70s and early 80s, the uh, enrollment at Morningstar has started to drop. And if you just have to look at Malton to, f to realize why. East of Goreway were condominium, condominiums, sorry, well, maybe they are. Apartments, um, multiplex, housing units, uh, um, shared units, townhouses, uh, lots and lots of multi-family dwellings. East of Goreway was mostly single-family homes. And it was on a bit older neighborhood. The kids had grown up, graduated, left. And they weren't being replaced with 
newer families with younger kids. Or if they were, the younger families would move in, and they'd stay there for a few years until the kids got to be about 11, 12 years old, and then they would buy a house somewhere else in Mississauga or somewhere in Toronto or Woodbridge, and they would move. And the demographics began to change uh, in the neighborhood. So you had, uh, initially, you had all these European-type countries. Then it began to evolve into a West Indies uh, community. Then it began to involve, uh, be evolved into a Tamil community. And then uh, you had Hindi families moving in and Punjabi families moving in and uh, Korean families and um, Vietnamese families. And it became a hodgepodge. And today, I would say it's a good chunk Islamic, a good chunk Hindi and Punjabi, a good chunk uh, um, Canadian, but uh, a lot of um, West Indian um the Indian subcontinent, uh, far a- East Asian, far, a- uh, far East. So you have a hodgepodge of different things. And what was initially a European community that would adhere to uh, European or British or American or Canadian school standards as pertains to music, for example, uh, in came a community that uh, some of my students never seen a trumpet before or never sung in a choir before. In some communities, some uh, cultures, music isn't a subject. It's not just not taught. Um, Music is a a frivolous pastime. So very often when I used to take my band to Darcel, for example, and uh, have the band play for them, for a lot of students who were new to Canada, that would be the first time they'd ever seen a saxophone or a trumpet, or didn't know what it was, never seen it before in their country. And uh, that was unique, because in a lo- almost every other school in the board, whether it was Chinkuzi or Gordon Graydon or T.L. Kennedy or whatever, um, these were established communities with established clientele, and their feeder schools, music programs, would be filled to the gills with, with um, instrumentalists already, and they would come into grade 9 already being able to play high-end um level uh, westernized music and uh, with Malton being a transitory community people would come in live for a couple of years move out it meant that I would get a student for maybe one or two semesters and then they'd move and if they were particularly good it was really heartbreaking to work with a student for one or two years in grade nine and ten for example really get them going and then their family would move to Woodbridge or Miss, or up to Caledon or over to Brampton, and I would lose that student. But it happened time and time and time again. And some of the best students that I, I taught went on to other schools because I would follow them on Facebook and we would keep in touch, or I'd follow them in other ways. And uh, they, they would call me and they'd say, I just graduated from Laurier and with a degree in music. I'm going, fantastic. I just wish you were here for the four years or five years. And not being able to teach grade 13 because of the Malton plan really hurt a lot of programs within the school, whether it was science, whether it was phys ed, English, moderns, uh, it really had an effect. And the extra programs that were um, that were brought in, some lasted, some didn't. So we had a hearing impaired program, which didn't last very long um, because plans changed. And uh, we brought in other programs like the Park Home uh, Park Program, which was primarily for uh, autistic students, and that was wonderful. I worked with them, and they were terrific. We even had adult education that was gotten rid of. Uh, at one time, we did have an OAC program that disappeared. So, uh, and with that, I think came the image that somehow Westwood, in particular, and Malton in general, wasn't an academic neighborhood. And uh, it resulted in not the greatest reputation that was totally undeserved. And I would go to workshops throughout the board, and people would say to me, don't you want to work in a real school? And I said, are you kidding? This is the best school on the board. Anybody can teach anywhere in the board. I could go to your school, I said, and I could teach at your school. There'd be no problem. But it takes a special teacher to come to Westwood or to Malton and later to Lincoln Alexander. 
and really connect with the students. And we had a veteran staff, uh, and they were wonderful. I mean, names like Mr. Finn um, and... Uh, um, uh, I've forgotten. There's quite a few people um, who come to mind. Uh, I'll remember them and I'll, no, I'll mention them later on. Mr. Maleka, for example. They, these people were golden, golden teachers and dealt so well with students of all kinds, not just the students with necessarily um, hiccups or handicaps or, or issues, with everybody. They dealt with everybody. And that was the beginning of, of this stigma, undeserved stigma, which Westwood and then Lincoln and Malton got stuck with because, quite frankly, the board paid more attention to other schools in the area. And then when Morningstar was around, they paid a lot of attention to Morningstar um, than they did to Westwood. And that was my argument from, for years, for 31 years. And when, when staff would say to me, well, don't you want to teach at a regular school, at a good school? I was approached by other schools within the board and even schools outside the board. One of the um, uh, School for the Arts in Toronto came to me and said, I hear the job you're doing. Would you like to work a, at a really good school with really good students? And I said, no way. No way. Um, this is the best school with the best students. Um, they, they don't take crap they see the, the the realistic nature of of what's being dealt with and if a teacher comes in and they've got this business going on and they you know they want to treat everybody with from a, a a teacher down point of view um or they want to lie or make up stuff or put on airs i said the students will eat you alive they'll eat you alive but if you respect them work with them and communicate with them, they will run across hot coals and through walls for you. And that's what I found. And that's why I spent 31 years at Westwood slash Lincoln, and I would never teach anywhere else. And if I could still be teaching, I still would be. But the Malton plan to save a new school from closing, um, had lasting effects on everybody in the community and the community was already a transitory community and the Malton plan attached a stigma to Westwood and then Lincoln which was totally undeserved and quite artificial and that's unfortunately just the way it came to be um, known and the interesting thing is teachers that have come to Westwood and Lincoln after hearing about them, oh my God, you're going to Lincoln, oh my God, blah, blah, blah. And they come to Lincoln and they say, you know, normally I would spend three years at a school and then leave, and three years at a school and then leave. I'm not leaving the school. I'm sticking around until I retire. Because why? It's that good. The students are that good. The students can, faces can change, clothing can change, culture can change, voices can change, accents can change, but students are still students. And that's important. And you treat them as such. And uh, for years, I had to deal with this this Malton plan, which handicapped the whole music program and arts programs for years, and even you know maybe even till that till now. Um, I know that I had to, to to in order to make sure that students could take music, I had to go to Darcel. I went to Dar. I didn't have to. I went to Darcel every single year for 31 years, and it was like a home away from home, uh, initially with Mr. Hot, and then later with a whole sig bunch of other teachers. But the students would know we were coming, and students who came into my music class in grade 9 would say, I saw you when I was in grade 3, and I was at Ridgewood. I remember you, and I'm so happy to be here in this school. So that's basically uh, uh, basically what it was. Anyway, that's the Malton plan. If you have any questions about that, um, leave comments below. And uh, I'm done with this. And uh, I'll maybe have some more questions and comments later on. In the meantime, do the whole subscribe thing. And, uh, and we'll see you uh, next time.